Good evening, everybody. Let me pull up my slides real quick. Uh, you've just heard all about the mechanism of action and all the data, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a discussion of our experience of Barestem. So we started uh, utilizing Barestem uh, back in November of 2021, uh, and primarily as a result of the state of heart therapy. If anybody was just opening session there, you can see that there is a significant gap between uh, scientific medicine in terms of what we do in trials and uh, our abilities to implement that therapy for our patients with heart failure. I'll give you a little bit of background of our uh, institution. Uh, we do just about everything but transplant. We have a pretty good uh, number of VADs as well as uh, remote monitoring. And then, uh, you know, we try to implement GDMT uh, according to the updated guidelines. We've been doing that for years prior to their publication. Uh, about the time that we started utilizing Barostem, uh, Evolution HF uh, study came out and uh, Dr. Yarnoff presented a little bit of that data and the difficulties with maintaining patients on GDMT, especially 12 months out. But uh, most recently, uh, there's another publication here with Evolution HF looking at the number of heart failure medicines uh, that patients were on at three months after discharge. And you can see in the U.S. in 2021, it's 1.5%. You can imagine if you quadruple or quintuple that, you're talking six, maybe 9%. Uh, after three months, right? Uh, that's a substantial number of patients that are not getting the therapy they need. And there are a lot of reasons. It's not just because we're not trying as a community. Uh, it's challenging, right? We're talking about four medications now for patients at a minimum, likely five with the diuretic, and then you include all of their other therapies if they're diabetic, hypertensive, at a heart disease, anywhere between eight to 10 medications. It is difficult. Uh, I know personally, because my wife just had a major surgery and I've been doing a lot of the nursing care of trying to get medicines every day, is not easy to keep up with. Uh, and this is lifetime, right? Ongoing forever. Uh, and so with that, I just wait around for all of our good ideas that we talk about to maybe implement five to 10 years down the road to hope that we can get more people onto therapy longer when we have a very viable therapy uh, with Barristan now to help people feel better. The other point I wanted to make here, uh, we talk a lot about GDMT and it's, it's important. So with all of our patients constantly trying to get them to stay on therapy and we work really hard at titrating our therapy. MEMS program, we try to get patients on appropriate therapy and up titrated as fast as possible in accordance with some of the strong HF data, trying to optimize them in maybe four to six weeks. But you can see here uh, with multiple studies, the percentage that were at target and most recently in Evolution HF, a very small number of patients are at target. And I think we just have to maybe collect a little bit of what would the outcomes be for those studies if that's the targets that were achieved. Um, it's just something to think about. And, and I think about this often because we have limitations based on blood pressure. Yeah. Uh, that, that limit our ability uh, to, to trade GDMT, as I'm sure you all do when taking care of heart failure patients. Oh. So with that, uh, when we talk about heart failure, Dr. Yarnoff mentioned the graph earlier, and what I like to do is look at Barostem as expanding the window of opportunity for our patients, not only to the right side. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, to the right side of the curve, but also to the left side as well. Uh, to try and start treating patients sooner rather than later. And I'll get into a little bit of why that is with some of the experience we've had with our patients. I put these indications up here. Uh, we've reviewed them uh, briefly uh, in terms of the indications for Barristan. But what I want to point out is this is not a therapy for class four heart failure patients. A lot of folks that I talk to want to implement this therapy as a salvage therapy. They wait till they're all out of options no GDMT options available, they can't do VAD, they can't do transplant, and you think, well, maybe we'll try this Barostim. I will tell you from experience that will not work well. All right, we've had patients that have come in and we've had very good success with our Barostim program, but when they are truly class four and they need a VAD or a transplant, they are not likely to thrive with this therapy. And we shouldn't be waiting that long to utilize this therapy because there are very good results for it. But I, 
I point this out to emphasize that we should not be waiting until they are class four uh, to consider Barostem. So a couple case examples, and I just throw these out here because there are patients that you've likely treated or have in your clinic currently that maybe you're considering. And I can tell you all the wonderful things about this patient as far as, you know, that he's a grandfather and his granddaughter comes in with him all the time. And she was begging for something to be done because we tried everything we could with therapy, but he kept getting hypotensive and lightheaded. And we discussed Barristim with him. He was all for it. We implanted it. I think he was our fourth patient that we implanted. Has not been rehospitalized in the last two years. Is enjoying his quality of life greatly. Is back to doing all the things he enjoys doing. Like these are the results that we want to see for our patients. And there's no way we were getting there with just GDMT. Uh, and so I think we, we have to really start kind of pushing the envelope a little bit for our patients uh, and get beyond GDMT when it's not available or when we can't titrate it uh, to maximally tolerated doses and we're not seeing the results and people are still having symptoms. This is another patient that we've had and I'm sure you've had discussions with your patients uh, similar to this. He was a gentleman, pretty advanced heart failure. We actually had him on inotropes for a bit. <clears throat> He had a very good response, came off of him, but we still had a lot of difficulty titrating uh, GDMT afterwards. And you just wasn't able to tolerate it, started dwindling. We've all seen patients with heart failure as they dwindle, they continually get worse. You remove a little bit of medication because they get hypotensive. You start considering adding digoxin, you know it's gonna get worse. And he flat out told me, I don't want an LVAD. It's not the kind of lifestyle I want, right? And with some of the data that we know from patients in their late 70s, going into their 80s, LVAD might not be the best option for some of those folks. Um, and again, not advocating this as a replacement therapy, uh, but this gentleman was uh, willing to consider it. He's had an outstanding response as well. Uh, has no symptoms. He's able to travel now all over the world, taking his daughters on wonderful trips and reconnecting with them, uh, with, his, with his grandkids, and uh, hasn't been readmitted in the last, he's about a year and a half, I think, uh, out from his device. So these are our results uh, for our patients. Uh, you can see we certainly didn't cherry pick any of our patients initially starting out. I would not recommend doing that with your patient population. Start them out earlier, get those early class three, three A folks, late class two, two B folks that have just had their recent decompensation. And if you can't get their therapy up titrated, then consider a device that's gonna help them feel better. Uh, our results have been consistent with what the data was showing. On average, we've had improvement in at least one NYHA class, if not two, minimal hospitalizations. Uh, this was over an N of 20 uh, when we reviewed these um, statistics and then a significant reduction in NT pro BNP. Lastly, uh, the titration, uh, do it quicker. Uh, it's recommended currently maybe on a monthly basis. We started doing that. And the uh, second gentleman I told you about, when he came in for his uh, month visit, said, what, do you, what am I doing with this thing? You, you put it in me and I don't feel any better. You, you sold me a bill of goods here. I said, we haven't even titrated yet. He's like, well, let's move this along. And so we talked about a two week titration with him uh, and he was game. And since then we do two, two week titrations for all of our patients because they start feeling better sooner, right? After their second or third titration, most people are noticing a substantial benefit. And so it moves things along for them. At that time, we don't really titrate any of our uh, GDMT. Uh, we do titrate diuretics as needed, depending on the patient's response. And then afterwards, uh, to Dr. Abraham's point, there is actually a stabilization of blood pressure, and we actually have seen uh, in some patients an improvement in blood pressure. So we've actually been able to add GDMT uh, back in that they were unable to tolerate before, uh, which has certainly been a nice effect. So in summary, uh, these are the patients that you want to target. Again, not class four patients. Do not wait that long. Late class two, two B, early class three, three A folks are going to be your ideal candidates. Uh, we don't have the data yet, but we've started looking at cardiac index. Uh, and I think perhaps a sweet spot might be 1.8 to 2.2 uh, for patients that are going to get substantial benefit. Um, hopefully we'll be able to publish something on that in the not too distant future. But it expands your therapeutic options. It gives you opportunities to make improvements for your heart failure patients. And overall, very good outcomes, very safe device, easy, 30 minutes, they go home the same day. With that, I'll hand that over to our last speaker. Thank you.